again, just by way of introduction, this is Jerry Dack. Um, um, at the um, podium with me is my co-host, Jim Anderson, who's the CEO of Social Flow. Social Flow is our partner company that compiles and analyzes all of the social media data that MPA is able to provide to its members in any of our reports. We're running the webinar today to help you become more familiar with the latest offering of our social media uh, report. Specifically, we're going to talk about the social media engagement factor, which we launched in the third quarter report that came out a few weeks ago. We think that um, this new element has enormous possibilities to serve you well in not only selling the social media programs for your brand, but also in helping to support the strength of your brand and thus promote cross-media platform packages. Um, we're delighted that there are so many people out there. Uh, we hope that this provides you with a lot of ammunition for your selling efforts and will also provide you with an introduction to Social Flow's approach to how your brand's social media efforts could be improved. You'll, you'll see their thinking and approach. Okay, so to begin, uh, here we go. Okay, so why engagement and why now? We believe that social media has a very important role in building your brand's audience as well as in supporting your selling efforts to both advertisers and agencies, and we have several key reasons why we believe this. First, social media demonstrates the singular nature and personality of your magazine brand's content and its importance to your audience. That's where the selling factor comes in. It measurably differentiates magazine brands from non-magazine brands. You'll see in our report that all of our analyses uh, pit any of our member brands against um, other brands like Digital Pure Plays or television brands' websites. So they're not associated with magazines. Second, it can quantify the influence your brand has to its fan base. Um, you all, I'm sure, talk about the importance that your editor has to your readers. And this is just another voice for that editorial staff to get out there in real time. And given the, the prejudice that a lot of advertisers have that the big digital pure plays like the Buzzfeeds and the refineries have all the power and influence, this is a way for you to burst that bubble and to show that it's not usually true. Lastly, Social media can expand your brand community even beyond the confines of that medium alone. So it can direct your followers to other of your brand offerings, whether it's your website, your printed or digital editions, your video programs, your promotions and events. And all of that will help increase the potential for monetization. So what are we doing to help you capitalize on the importance of this? Well, the social media engagement report is a new section of our quarterly social media report. Most of you, if you are members participating in the report, should be getting that from us uh, every quarter. Or up to the introduction of engagement, we've been providing likes and followers by magazine brand, by social media network, and information about the growth of each of those networks. But as of the third quarter report, we now include a very robust section on engagement, again, by brand and by social media network. The methodology was developed here at MPA, and then we consulted with uh, several social media executives at our member companies to make sure it was sound, it was usable, and to get everybody's opinion on and, and input on how they do it on their end. Uh, we wanted something that could work for any brand on any network and would be absolutely comparable. So you now have an ongoing analysis that measures the social media engagement of magazine brands versus non-magazine brands. And the results of this will help you um, against those digital pure, pure play properties. 
Um, the beauty of the methodology is that it, it works on any network. No matter, each network has its own nomenclature um, for different actions consumers might take, but it all can be boiled down into one bucket that can go into this formula and make it usable no matter which network you apply it to. So let's look at the formula. Okay, here it is. It, social media engagement factor is the relationship of the total social actions for a brand in a particular time period to the publisher post that occurred for that brand in that same time period. So by social actions, we mean all the touch points that are unique to each social network's offering, but all of those touch points, no matter what they're called, all fall into the same buckets. They can be approval actions like likes and plus ones. They can be responsive actions like comments or replying to a post. Or they could be distribution actions like sharing and retweeting and repinning. The publisher posts are all cases of content that are entered onto the social media pages by the publisher. This does not include any promotional posts that are paid for by your advertisers. So basically, we're measuring the interactions of your brand's fans based on the interest in your content. It's a really simple concept. I'm going to turn it over to Jim now to talk more about this and to show you how it could be used uh, in your selling efforts. Great. Thanks, Jerry. And just to echo, I, I really do love this factor and, and I love the simplicity and how it takes this complicated terminology and, and just lets you not trip over yourself. I, I deal with this stuff all day, every day, and I sometimes find myself tripping over, is it a fan or is it a follower? Is it a like? Is it a reaction? Is it a plus one? Is it a pin? And so, again, uh, part of this is just to try to simplify things down and, and make life a little bit easier as you deal with multiple social networks and, and probably a portfolio of responsibilities that's not just purely focused focused on social. Uh, if you have other things you're dealing with as well, uh, you know, social media can, can be you know, at times baffling because it's, it's also not uncommon for the social networks to change the way they do things. For instance, when Facebook changed from having only likes to the actual reactions where you can have haha, -ha, angry, you know, et cetera, now calling it a like is not, not sufficient enough or is no longer as accurate as it, as it once was because there are other reactions as well. But if you jump into the next slide, I think implicit in these social media engagement factor type questions questions is, well, what, what good is that, right? I mean, what, what good is a Facebook like to me? And I've had that conversation many times with many media companies. And it really is it's a great question because it's, it's, a, it's a surprisingly difficult to answer. And probably many of you all spend your days trying to figure out how to answer. And really what I would come back to is this slide here where we talk about using public data to help you draw private conclusions. And I make that distinction because you can see on the, on the private side, you know for your own property or properties what impressions you get, what reach you get on Facebook, what clicks you, how many clicks you get back to your web property. And then of course you've got uh, you know, all kinds of metrics on your web properties and, and understand that traffic probably intensely well because it's really important to your business. So really the whole goal of this is how do we take what we can get from the public, whether it be from other potentially competing titles in the magazine media world or as Jerry was talking about, say the BuzzFeeds and Vices of the world, these other pure play companies, how do we um, take their data? You can, obviously can't get to their private data, but you can see how many fans and followers they have. You can see how many posts they have. You can see how many social actions their posts get. And what we've done by crunching a tremendous amount of data is, is develop a fairly good correlations back on saying how you can use these social actions to correlate back and draw reasonable conclusions. And again, you've got to be careful. You all are, are fairly quantitatively oriented, so you understand the pitfalls and perils of small sample sizes and, and how you need to be careful to not go too far in extrapolating you know, what you can see from somebody else's public data. But we have seen across hundreds and hundreds of properties and you know, th three years worth of monthly data at this point that you can actually draw some really useful conclusions. So that's what we're ultimately trying to do is help you answer that question, what is the value of, a, of say, a like, and, and how do I tie that back to my business? And as we go through here, hopefully that will become clearer and more obvious. 
So as you look at this uh, slide here now, this is, is buying different social networks for all magazine brands, and, and we're making the distinction between the magazine and non-magazine brands, as you'll see here in the upcoming slides. And so you see just lots of big numbers here, and, and the tyranny of all data analysis is just really easy to get the, into the weeds, and there's lots of very large numbers. If we were to break this down by properties and, and put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and again, as Jerry said, you all have the ability to get access to various slices of this data, uh, as, as part of being an MPA member, um, you, you can very quickly get lost in all the data. So we try to find these you know, simplified high-level ways to tell meaningful stories, and, and that's what you're seeing right here across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, and Pinterest is on here, but I'm not going to talk much about Pinterest because just the reality of it now is for most brands, uh, it's not particularly relevant. There are a handful or a subset of brands where Pinterest is really quite interesting, but in the grand scheme of MPA membership, that's relatively small use case. And, and also Pinterest is a, is a very different uh, from the, the other three. It's, it's somewhat different in a lot of ways from Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So just for sake of brevity, I'm not going to talk much about Pinterest today. But you see this first row that's highlighted here, the total aggregate likes or followers, depending on your terminology here. I, I like to call that out. And Facebook, we all know, is the big dominant company. We also know that Instagram is owned by Facebook. So, you know, it, it, lest anybody doubt Facebook's dominance in the, in the world, those two, you know, giant social networks uh, occupy a significant amount of consumer attention. Those are, of course, not unduplicated numbers. If I'm a fan of, uh, say, Sports Illustrated and Architectural Digest and Car and Driver and, you know, a dozen other magazine media titles, those will all be counted you know, multiple times there. So that 492 million number is not unique, but it is illustrative to say, wow, there are an aggregate 492 million Facebook fans across all of these uh, MPA magazine brand uh, uh, titles, and then you see the Twitter numbers, the Instagram, and, and the relative distribution there. So again, m most of the activity, at least if you just look at the, at the fan or follower count, is, is Facebook has got about half of it, uh, and then relatively evenly split between Twitter and Instagram. The other one, uh, thing I'd like to point out as we go on to the next slide is the, the total publisher posts down below that third row, uh, and you'll see there that the actual number of posts and the quantity of posts ends up being one of the most differentiating areas for magazine media companies, especially compared to brands marketers, you know, advertisers, you know, there, there's a lot of narratives out there that marketers can become like newsrooms and they can create their own content. And while that is true in some ways, it, it turns out marketers, you know, just to be blunt and candid, are usually not very good at doing that. Um, it's not their core competency, it's not their core capability, and where it shows most obviously is in this volume. So 230,000 Facebook posts, 405 thousand Twitter posts. I mean, that may or may not seem like a big number to you, uh, but I will tell you that that is, is really, those are large numbers, and, and we see that pretty consistently as magazine media providers. Literally, we have some of the bigger uh, clients we have publish more than 100,000 stories a month uh, across uh, different social networks, and, and you can use in your own imagination who those companies probably are, and maybe you work for those companies, right? So you, you start to get some scale, and even if you work for one of the smaller companies, you all are prolific content creators for your titles, uh, and that's a real advantage because you, ultimately you've got more stories to tell, you've got more social posts that go along with those stories, and you can get them out more frequently and have high-quality content available to be seen by a, a relatively large audience. Uh, with great frequency. The, the missing piece of the puzzle, and today we don't talk too much about that, but perhaps in a future webinar we can talk about the revenue generation and how do we combat the, the duopoly effectively. Facebook and Google are uh, generating the lion's share of the advertising revenue. That's ultimately where we, we want to get you, but uh, you know, you've got many of the foundational pieces in place, as you can see here, in terms of you've got lots of high-quality content reaching a, a pretty large audience, especially compared to, say, what the marketers themselves can do. Uh, if you'll advance to the next slide, you can see I just wanted to hone in on Instagram and point out a couple of quick things here because Instagram is quite puzzling, and I bet uh, if you spend any time looking at your own data, you've, you've probably had to answer this question yourself of what's going on with Instagram. This is, this is sort of interesting. And you see the, the, the follower or the like count on Instagram is you know, relatively high. There have been a lot of uh, magazine media brands that have gotten lots of followers on Instagram, which is, is fantastic, you know, almost to the point of being as much as Twitter, not quite in the, in the same realm as Facebook but still impressive in its own right. But then you look at the engagement actions, you're like, holy cow, I'm, I've got half the, the fans on Instagram or followers on Instagram that I do on Facebook, but look at the engagement. I've got like four times the amount of engagement going on. What, what's going on? And, and that is um, actually the reality is we see tremendous engagement on Instagram, and more importantly, you see tremendous in engagement on Instagram. It is a 
really important and popular platform depending on you know how you measure things and who you listen to in, in many ways it is is beating snap at snap's own game of you know creating a really different uh, type of experience something that that is maybe more oriented towards millennials and and more snap snapchat like in some ways than snapchat itself and so you know set aside you know your own personal or, or my own personal opinions about snapchat versus instagram it is quite an impressive platform and you see you know significant engagement actions but as i point out on the next slide here the the challenge there and you all again probably know this all too well uh, is it's really hard to put a lot of Instagram content out there. And if you look at just those numbers, I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude less Instagram content than, say, Facebook or, or Twitter content out there. And the reason for that is actually quite simple, is they make it quite difficult to put content on Instagram. There really is no good practical way to put content out to Instagram other than to sit there on your mobile device and to compose an Instagram post as the – the account owner for whatever you know magazine you know media brand you or brands you represent and you compose it there are some sort of hacky workarounds and things like that but by and large instagram has made a conscious choice to not opening up publishing api so when you use social flow as many of you or many of your colleagues do to publish to facebook twitter and other social networks you can't use it to publish to instagram and that's a an intentional limitation on instagram's part um and the the uh pragmatic impact of that is you get a lot less content. So you see Instagram is like 5% of the overall posts, but generates 77% of the total engagement actions, which is just a, a, a sort of an astounding set of numbers. But here's one really, really important caveat, and that's why I, I called it out in that bubble right below the 5%, is that it's effectively zero clicks to your website. In, Instagram is generally not clickable back to your website the same way that Facebook and Twitter are. And, and that's not a 100% true statement. There are ways that clicks can be generated from Instagram. But just by and large, if you want to look at it at a very high level, Instagram is going to give you engagement there in the mobile uh, app from your you know fans and followers and from people who like your content but it's not going to generate click traffic back to your website by and large and so that's a really important uh, footnote to put in there because you know that's where historically all of your monetization has come from is is on your traffic back to your website so if you don't have that that's a real 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 big problem so again a very interesting landscape this is is really evolved we've been working with the MPA it's probably close to three years now on versions of the social media report and Instagram has very very much come on strong especially in the past 12 uh, to 18 months to where this is a very different conversation than it was say, a year a year and a half ago so all of that foundational uh, material laid let's get into a little bit more of the data here on on this next slide here and and this is just the high level findings again it's not about presenting rows and rows of data it's about telling stories that you can then use to tell to your, your management, to your advertisers, to whatever your constituents are about what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're doing well. And so at the very simplest level is just to take the magazine media brands across the entire MPA uh, data set and compare it to the non-magazine media brands. And as I'm sure you've seen in the engagement findings that have come out from Jerry and team, you know, magazine media does incredibly well. I mean, you've got close to twice the Instagram uh, engagement factor, uh, you know, on, uh, there for, for your magazine media brands. And again, not surprising when you think about, wow, you've got some really iconic long-term, you know, brands that have built a huge amount of equity over years, if not decades. Facebook is a little bit tighter, but still a pretty significant, uh, you know, difference there in, in terms of percentages. What's that, 10, 20 percent um, greater in terms of your Facebook engagement factor? And then Twitter is slightly less, but that's, you know, so close as to be, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, essentially a wash. And then we'll, we won't talk about Pinterest, uh, as we said. But you, you get the general idea uh, that, that you've got a really good story. And at a high level, this illustrates that. As we move forward and we start to dive into a little bit more detail, uh, you can now, now start to put a narrative around that. And I won't uh, spend time because we've got just a few minutes on this webinar telling you all the different things. But as you see these slides, which will be made available to you after the webinar, you can see some general conclusions and ideas about how you can represent your findings and the overall findings and why is Instagram different than Facebook, et cetera. So just, again, helping people who maybe don't spend a, a big chunk of their day thinking about the differences between social networks understand and put this in context is often quite a useful thing. And so these narratives will help you do that uh, as well. But getting deeper into the data here in these uh, next few slides here, you can see um, now we've broken it down uh, into the categories. And these are content categories defined by the MPA. And this is uh, you know, one step below what we were just talking about, which is all magazine brands. But, but one step above, here's every 
single title, and which I think is 400 rows worth of data. Um, and so just putting things into a, a content category and then trying to simplify it down so we don't get into numbers and having to put percentages and those types of things. Just the green check mark, I mean, it's pretty intuitive what that means. It means it's good and you're doing better. Um, and then the, you know, the red X's obviously is you're, you're not doing as well. And again, it just depends, right? There's a, there's a lot of variability across titles, across categories, but in general, magazine media fares incredibly well. Uh, compared to non-magazine media brands, and so there's a, there's very much a good story to be told in almost every case. And we'll dive into even even some ones where it doesn't look like there's as good a story to be told. There are usually subsegments of the story that actually are quite good too. So going back to what Jerry said as we kicked off this call, there really are some great stories you can tell to illustrate the power of the magazine media brands and the power of what you're doing on social and how you all are extending that to social. And, and it's not just sort of made up, oh, I think we're doing well because here's one Facebook post or one tweet. I mean, this is based on you know, real data that's analyzed, pulled, you know, rigorously looked at every, uh, every month. And so you know, there, there's a fair amount of rigor that's going on here so you can feel confident that this is, you know, this is a reasonable data set and a reasonable set of conclusions. Uh, as we go to the next slide here, we're going to see this is an illustration of, you know, getting into a little bit more, you know, detail here where you can see all the way down to the magazine brand level. And, and this is, you know, as always, when you start naming names, that's when things get to be a little tricky. And, and I'm quite sensitive to the fact that the MPA is an industry association and so needs to treat all members you know, equally, and, and frankly, we're a software company. We work for many of the MPA members, and so we, we love all of our clients. And so, uh, you know, we're certainly not in the business of trying to, to make judgments about who is, you know, doing poorly, say, for instance, or, or who's, uh, you know, who needs to do something different, right? What we want to do is be honest brokers of the data and represent it in, in smart and informed ways that can help uh, individual companies and our customers improve, and then more broadly, the entire magazine media ecosystem, which we're, we're quite fond of. We think that you all really don't get enough credit for the great content you put out there. And in many ways, you all are really are winning as it relates to generating and sustaining consumer attention. Unfortunately, you're not winning as it relates to the revenue associated with that attention, and that's just a structural dynamic of, of what's going on right now in social media and the digital ecosystem more broadly that certainly we spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to help you all work at ways to improve. Uh, there's one more slide here that shows the non-magazine brand. So again, you get the general idea here, and I'll let Jerry speak to you know, what level of granularity is available in these reports to members and what ways. There's a lot of things that uh, you all have the ability to access as MPA members, and, and she can certainly speak to you know, th those details. But if you're interested in diving into the data and getting into a little bit more of the raw source material yourself, I think there's some avenues to do that. Uh, and, and you can then get down to the title level. Because we have noticed it's interesting. It's not always easy to define who thinks, uh, who people think of as their competitive set, right? It's easy to say, okay, well, if I'm Time Magazine, who might I define as my competitive set? Sometimes it's obvious, though, sometimes it's not. And so that, that can actually be quite interesting, too. And we try to make sure we have as much of a data set to allow the flexibility and creativity to look at your, uh, your title's success uh, as measured by other magazine media titles or as measured by other you know, non-magazine media titles in whatever way or ways uh, that are relevant to you. And of course, uh, the numbers are all different across the different social networks too. Maybe you want to hone in on Instagram or you really want to focus on Twitter or you do have one of those brands that's particularly relevant on Pinterest. And so again, all the data is of course going to be completely different uh, by, by social network. Charging ahead here, uh, in the interest of trying to get through our, all of our material here, there's just a lot to talk about as you, as you see. I mean, it's a great set of data, but it, it, the real challenge is distilling it down and honing this. Uh, so this is a good sales slide example. If you wanted to illustrate for your sales teams, maybe for your ad sellers or your planners, you know, why my brand or my brands are doing better than the, they say the average or the typical magazine media brand, this is a great way to present it. And this is an MPA format, which I, I really like. You go across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, et cetera. You can look at the engagement factor. And now you start to see the real help of having something that's just a simple engagement factor that you can throw out there. Maybe you'll throw it out there for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Maybe you're just trying to focus on Instagram. Who, who knows? Depends on the conversation you're having with whoever is receiving this. But you can say, hey, here's my magazine media brand. Here's how it compares to the average. And you can see in this particular example, it compares you know, very favorably not to, to the average magazine media brands, which themselves compare very favorably to non-magazine media brands. And then you've got the footnoted material that helps you, you see you know, how that works. So imagine this slide in effectively a sales presentation, an ad sales presentation that your sellers or planners are putting out to your advertisers. It's really a nice way to set yourself apart. 
And then that's just one example. The next slide shows a, at least eight different ways where you could segment out and say, okay, I want to look at my brand against others in my content category or against all brands or against all non-magazine brands. And you see this, you know, matrix. It's a, effectively got eight different blocks, eight different ways that you could present yourself against other uh, other titles or other groups of titles. And, and it's really even more complicated than that. If you multiplied that by three different social networks, it's, it's not eight ways you could sort of present a story. It's more like 24 when you look at, it, at each of these across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And then if you add Pinterest on top, it, it's even more. So uh, again, you all are, are relatively familiar with all of the ways to present complex data sets uh, in simple ways. You get the general idea. But this is, uh, we just want to make sure to let everybody know that there is a great way to tell really strong and powerful and data supported stories out to the marketplace uh, using this data, which by the way changes and is updated every single month. So there's always a, a sort of a new story to be told. And in the last few minutes, I just want to highlight this, this sort of, it's very hard to see in this small format, but one of the things we've done to try to provide more depth, and this is a little bit more of a research project, uh, these bubble charts, which many of you all probably find quite intuitive and you understand the beauty of representing three separate data points on a bubble chart. Some people look at this and like, oh my goodness, that, I don't know quite what to make of that. Um, but it's really a great way to, and this is for the thought leader category on Facebook, you can see uh, the, the size of the bubble represents effectively the engagement, not the engagement factor, but just the cumulative engagement. And so what we're showing here is your fan count on the x-axis, the number of posts in a month on the y-axis, and then the size of the bubble represents the engagement. And we've done a lot of work trying to find different ways. And for a reasonably technical audience such as yourselves, this is a really, really good way to help look at and start to tease out differentiation. And, and for all the obvious reasons, I haven't labeled them here because, again, I'm not in the position of trying to make you know, anybody feel like they're not doing a good job. There's plenty of circumstances that might explain why a dot is small or why a, a circle is in a, in a particular place on the chart. Probably most of you can guess at the, uh, at the magazine media brand that's got 45 million Facebook fans, um, which in the case of this Facebook example is, you know, is, wow, that's pretty profoundly different. I mean, it's way more than twice as many fans as any other magazine brand, although not necessarily twice as much um, engagement. I mean, they do very well, but not necessarily um, you know, so much so that, that everybody else can't feel like they're doing well uh, also. And then if you advance to the next slide, it's the same type of chart on Twitter, and you see more distribution, which is pretty typical on Twitter. It, Twitter's less clearly defined, less, you know, pure, you know, people who you could call winning in a big significant way, more distribution, and less overall engagement too, and, and more even distribution of engagement. And this is almost all the same brands as what you saw on the Facebook uh, page as well. So you're just seeing uh, greater distribution and smaller overall fan counts. And then lastly, here on the Instagram, same, same idea. Now look, the post volume much, much lower. Remember, you know, we're talking about even for this, this uh, top right circle that's got almost 5 million fans and 180 posts a month. 180 posts in a month for Instagram is really not that many, right? 30 days in a month or so you do that math. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's six, what's it, six posts a day, which for a magazine media title is, is really not that many. Um, and so again, that's just sort of the nature of, of Instagram and what you see. But wanted to give you a flavor of you know, how we look at these things as we get into more granular detail. Uh, and I'll leave the bubble charts at this point, and then we'll just wrap up here because we are out of time, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We are happy to work with you. We, many of you are our clients already, and so uh, whether your editorial teams, your revenue teams, we would be happy to work with you and help you build your story and expand your story using this data or your own data. Uh, and, and if you're not a Social Flow customer, of course, we'd love to talk to you about being a Social Flow customer, but that's not my purpose today. And just a little nickel tour of what we do. We do work with a huge slice of the magazine media industry and then a bunch of other media clients as well. We, we are very much specialists in media companies and how media companies get their content out to social networks and would love to talk with you a little further on that. And I think the last slide we have is just a conclusion slide, and I want to turn it over to whatever time we have for Q&A. I believe we can go a little bit long on Q&A. Um, uh, we don't have anywhere we have to be, but we want to be respectful. If people need to drop off, of course, you'll do that. Uh, but, but feel free to stay on, and we'll answer as many questions as you have here. And I, I won't read all this again in the interest of time, but we, we do think this is hugely valuable uh, content that you can use in some really interesting ways. Appreciate your time today, and happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, I am checking what questions came in on the online. Um, please feel free to enter some more now if you'd like to. Um, here's a question. Can you help us analyze our information to develop 
a sales story? Um, we both should answer that. From the standpoint of MPA, we certainly can. Um, we can help you put together the uh, category type slides if you know you provide the information about what you see as your competitive set and what the pure plays are that you go up against in RFPs all the time. Uh, we can help you with that and teach you how to do that every quarter. And then separately, Social Flow can certainly help you. Do you want to pick that up, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. And my, my contact information is on the last slide. You can con contact me directly or sales at socialflow.com. You know, many of you all, we already are talking with your sales teams, and I, we'd love to continue that conversation or talk to you about how to you know, arm your sales teams. Uh, and just one uh, related fact, I actually spend a fair amount of time talking to your advertisers as well. So I've, I've gone out and met with GlaxoSmithKline Smith and John Hancock and other advertisers, just trying to calibrate and make sure that, that I understand how they're perceiving things. And there is a real appetite from advertisers to capitalize on magazine media companies' success on social, just to be simple and short in the interest of time. They just don't know how to do that, right? They don't get told very often, okay, here's how I can advertise in smart ways uh, on social networks with magazine media companies to accomplish my objectives. So there's a real appetite out there from the buy side, from the demand side, to you know ha tell these stories. And I, I probably spend 70% of my time on the, the monetization revenue generating side of things, which is built on top of the foundation here of all this data and all the success that magazine media companies are already having. Okay. Um, another question was how many non-magazine brands are analyzed in the report. Um, I don't have the number right at the tip of my fingers, but several hundred magazine brands and several hundred non-magazine brands are analyzed. It's a very, very diverse list of the non-magazines. And originally that list was given to us, submitted to us, by each participating member in the social media report. We asked, who are the digital players that you're up against? Who are the non-magazine competitors that you find yourself uh, against in RFPs or in meetings? We took that list and we vetted that list to make sure they were active in social media. And uh, over the last year or two, some of those have fallen out and other new ones have come in. So we're always augmenting and updating. And at any time, if any of our members has a specific need for um, a brand to be added, a uh, non-magazine brand, we're happy to do so, and we will work with Social Flow to add that information in. So it, it's very extensive. I dare say you, you, you won't have a problem finding a competitive set to put together. And Jerry, um, just to add, to, to, I'll tell you, there's 582 rows in the spreadsheet. I know because I look at it all the time. Uh, and uh, so you know, I, I don't remember the exact split, as you said, but it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Call it roughly 600 uh, brands across magazine and non-media, and non-magazine media. Here's a question for you, Jim. Hang on. Can you, can you talk a bit more about the proportional difference between Facebook and Instagram? I guess they're meaning in the performance. I can go, I can go back to that if, let's see. Yeah, de definitely. So I, I'm looking at the slide too, where we were highlighting the, the boxes uh, around things. So you know, c clearly, Instagram many many fewer posts. You know, so 230,000 Facebook posts and 36,000 Instagram posts. So it's not quite one tenth or it's a little bit more than one-tenth of posts, but, um, but yet the engagement is, is so much higher, four times the engagement on roughly one-tenth the posts. So, but let's talk, it sort of gets into a bit of esoteric ter territory. What does engagement really mean and how valuable is it? And is just somebody clicking a, you know, a thumbs up button, uh, you know, as good as a share? Well, in general, you know, people tend to view things sort of hierarchically, uh, just a simple reaction or a like is good, uh, you know, some sort of comment is better, some sort of share is even better. And so you get into that awfully subjective territory. But the fact of the matter is, is what I would take away from those Instagram numbers is Instagram has just got a massive amount of consumer attention. It is very easy for people to just open up, scroll through, and then when they, there, there's, a, there's sort of a habit that seems to have formed with Instagram users when they like something, and oftentimes it's just they like the look of it, right? Instagram is very visual. It's just so easy to click the like 
uh, or the thumbs up or whatever that icon is, is called. I can't even remember off the top of my head. And so you just see that a lot more than you do on Facebook. I, I don't know that it means that much more, so I wouldn't say by looking at this that, oh, Instagram is somehow more important than Facebook. I don't believe that that's the case. Uh, at all, especially when you consider that uh, effectively 0% of those interactions result in clicks back to your website, which is how you actually monetize. So it's a bit of a conundrum in some ways. It's like, well, we, we have to pay attention to Instagram because it's really quite important and it's clear that many of our audience members consume our content on that channel, but it's going to be a lot fewer posts and it's going to be a very high number of reactions, but with a lot less business impact than say what's going on on Facebook. And then Twitter is even different. I won't, I won't spend as much time talking about Twitter. Uh, Twitter definitely is real time and, and there's a certain brands that think t Twitter is incredibly important and then a lot of other brands that are like, well, you know, Twitter is probably the, the, the third at best and most important social network to what we do. Question, I'm sorry, I think that's the last question that came through on the online, uh, on the chat line. Um, Please feel free to contact either MPA through me. Um, wait a minute. Is that, I think, oh, wait a minute. There's one more question. Hang on. Okay. Over what time frame is the 230? This is um, an average month, an average 30-day period during third quarter, if that helps. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can put you in touch with social uh, with social flow, or you can reach out to Jim directly, and um, we'll be happy to help you with anything that you want to do with this data or do with your social media efforts. Yes, and I'd like to add my thanks. Uh, thanks, Jerry, and to the MPA for setting this up. Thank you all for your time and, and attention. We really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you about this.